All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, so as the slide says, uh, this is Cryptography Pitfalls, and my name is John Downey. Uh, if you are interested in my slides, I've already tweeted out a link to them, so you can uh, check out my Twitter. That's a trick to try to get you to follow me on Twitter. But uh, so the basis for this talk, like why I've gone around and given it to a couple places, is because I see developers making the same mistakes over and over again when trying to work with cryptography. Uh, so this is really a cautionary tale. I like to base, like I'm a real big fan of listening to other people talk about failures, because uh, I think we can learn a lot from that. So I wanted this to be grounded in like real things, like real places where stuff failed. Uh, and I want, I want people to kind of take away, it's like, oh, like I remember this from this talk. Maybe I'm in over my head and I should get some professional help. Uh, so that's, that's my goal uh, and kind of a little bit of a context why I, uh, I've been giving this. Uh, I do not live in Philadelphia. This is actually my very first trip to Philadelphia. Uh, I live in Chicago, but I'm very happy to be here. Uh, really quick, uh, so I work at Braintree, where I lead the security team. Uh, the only reason this is kind of important is just to give you a little bit of a background. Uh, Braintree, if you're not familiar with it, helps businesses take payments, like credit cards. We obviously deal with a lot of crypto uh, around that. Also, uh, more importantly, uh, Braintree was acquired by PayPal a couple years ago, uh, so I need to say this. Uh, if you ever work for a big public company, you'll recognize this statement. Uh, these are my views, don't hold them against my employer. So I want to quickly give kind of an overview of like, what do we expect out of mine crypto? Why are we even using it? Uh, and when we think about cryptography, we're usually thinking about three purposes. The first one's confidentiality, and that is when I send a message, I expect it to be kept secret between me and the time the receiver sees it. Anybody in the middle, uh, eavesdropping, shouldn't be able to decrypt the message. Uh, this is really like the thing when you say cryptography, everybody sort of gets it and jumps to this one. Next one's authentication or integrity protection. Uh, when you're sending a message, you expect the message not to have been modified uh, in transmission by anybody. Uh, so that the other end can kind of validate that this message hasn't been modified in transit. Uh, that's important because you could be sending things like military orders, and you don't want those military orders to get modified in transit. And then the last one's identification. This is like who sent the message. Uh, you often see this combined with authentication in the form of digital signatures. Uh, you know, John signed this message, and it hasn't been modified since John sent it. And cryptography itself, uh, at least in the modern sense, is a rigorous science. Uh, it's, a lot of the times it's based on hard math problems, and they're math problems we consider hard on classical computers, like laptops, and even today's supercomputers are all still what we would think of as a classical computer. You can read that as uh, not a quantum computer. I do have a little bit at the end about quantum computers and how it's kind of leaking into our current thinking. Uh, so it's a rigorous science based on math problems like factoring large numbers into their base primes, which you may know is the problem behind RSA. Uh, and so what we're really doing is we're betting on no major advancements in either mathematics or computing. Uh, that's what cryptography is doing. And like any science, crypto should be peer reviewed. Uh, you know, we, we've been really, really good about getting into the heads of everybody the whole uh, don't design your own crypto. Like, I think that's been, like, uh, cargo culted enough that most people can kind of repeat that and understand it. Uh, but we also need to make sure that don't design your own crypto also carries over into, like, don't implement your own crypto. So uh, sometimes you'll see people say, well, I implemented AES myself in code that I wrote. I didn't design AES. Uh, and there are still a lot of really subtle problems that are going to come up and bite you in those cases. Uh, next thing, uh, we, you know, we think of... Uh, things like Kirchhoff's principle, which is that a system should be completely public in its information except for the key. I should be able to tell you entirely how our encryption system works, and it should be no less secure, uh, as long as I don't have to, as long as I don't also give you the key. That's kind of the ideal uh, in modern crypto. We also think of this as like combating security through obscurity. Uh, crypto itself is very strong. I don't expect to wake up and read in the like, Ars Technica or on Hacker News or whatever that AES is broken. Um, however, the, I wouldn't be surprised if I woke up and said something to the effect of the way OpenSSL implements AES in this specific way 
that's broken and it's catastrophic, go update your OpenSSL. That I expect to happen and we do occasionally see things along those lines. Uh, but like anything in security, uh, a system is really fragile, uh, most fragile at its intersection. So the places where things have to kind of come together, the joints between the, the various primitives. And primitives often kind of get misused uh, and misunderstood. So a lot of times when we see break, breaks in crypto, we see it at these seams between the different primitives. And unfortunately, the, the missteps are really catastrophic. Uh, and lastly, I kind of wanted to, uh, I'll read this to you real quick uh, because I think it's important. You've probably seen the door to a bank vault, at least in the movies. You know, 10 inch thick hardened steel with huge bolts to lock it in place. It certainly looks impressive. We often find the digital equivalent of such a vault door installed in a tent. The people standing around it are arguing over how thick the door should be rather than spending their time looking at the tent. Uh, this is from a book called Cryptography Engineering by a bunch of rather famous cryptographers, including Bruce Schneier. Uh, and what I kind of think they're getting at is sort of, you know, you'll, it's not, it's not hard to find a conversation among crypto or security people where they'll be like, we should be using a 128 bit key. No, it must be a 256 bit key. Uh, and totally ignoring the fact that the system that they're talking about has like really easy SQL injection and like blatant cross site scripting and stuff like that. So, you know, just like totally ignoring the weak parts of the system. Uh, and anything, uh, if you take anything away from this presentation, this is kind of like the slide where it's like, oh, okay, if I'm doing this, here's the thing. So for data in transit, use TLS. Uh, we used to call this SSL. Now we call it TLS for a variety of reasons. Uh, use SSH or some kind of VPN. Data in transit means data going across a network or a wire. For data at rest, use GPG. Uh, this data at rest means on a hard drive, on some kind of flash drive up in the cloud like S3. Uh, if you need it to be encrypted at rest, use, uh, use GPG. Uh, if you need to sign something, for right now, use GPG. Um, th like those are kind of the recommendations. If you can't fit your problem into one of these three, try to rework it until you can, because you'll save yourself a lot of headaches if you can. And ultimately, uh, I like to talk about avoiding low-level libraries. Uh, I liken this to giving developers a bucket of razor blades and asking them to build a saw. Uh, you're really bound to kind of hurt yourself if you don't know exactly what you're doing. Uh, Low-level libraries, things like OpenSSL, uh, PyCrypto, and Bouncy Castle, these work at too low of a level. They kind of give you these really basic primitive building blocks and expect you to build something useful out of them. Instead, using a high-level library like uh, Salt or Libsodium or Keysar from Google, uh, these, you know, you can find these with bindings to every single language under the sun, so they're really easy to kind of pick up. I did, however, promise some pitfalls, so that's what we're going to get to next. Uh, first one being random number generation. So random numbers are really important. We use them for encryption keys, API keys, session tokens, password reset tokens, the, you know, everywhere. And our systems really do rely on this. Uh, the first pitfall is not using a cryptographically strong random number generator. Uh, there is a paper presented at the 2012 Usenix conference called I Forgot Your Password Randomness Attacks Against PHP Applications, where they surveyed a bunch of PHP applications and found some where they were just using the built-in Mersenne Twister kind of built-in PHP random number generator to generate password reset tokens. And through a lot of analysis, they were able to uh, guess password reset tokens sent to email to a user before, uh, without ever being involved in that transaction. So they were able to predict the password reset token and then use it to reset a password. And that is because this, these, this PHP systems were not using crypto strong random number generators when they should have. Uh, and this is just a visual example of what I'm talking about. So the one on the left uh, was generated using a not crypto strong random number generator. And if you look, you can kind of see there's a wavy pattern to it. That's exactly the thing you don't want in your random data. Uh, you don't want patterns. Uh, and then the system, or the graph on the drawing on the right, was uh, just a r completely random dump of data. The next one, using broker random number generators. Uh, unfortunately, it seems this is becoming like every, every system's got their day in the sun. And so uh, very recently, uh, GPG had one that had been in there for, I think, like 12 years. Uh, Debian had their famous one. This was uh, 2006 to 2008. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, uh, in Debian, this line was commented out out of the Debian packages of OpenSSL uh, for about two years. 
Uh, and this line was commented out in two places, and if you don't know what it does, that's fine. What it was doing is it was mixing in random data from the operating system into OpenSSL's random number generator, which was important. <laughs> and uh, it was commented out in the two places, and because Debian is sort of the parent distribution for a lot of other distributions, it made its way into Ubuntu and Nopix and tons of other places. Uh, and for two years, this meant the random number generator for OpenSSL on Debian-based systems was completely broken. And this sort of goes to show that uh, bad cryptography often looks a lot like good cryptography, uh, and you don't really know it until someone comes in and breaks your stuff. Uh, this was the commit message it went in under. Uh, don't add uninitialized data to the random number generator. This stops Valgrind from giving error messages and unrelated code. If you're not familiar, Valgrind helps find memory failures or memory problems in C programs. Uh, so it was essentially uh, trying to fix a compiler warning. Uh, it wasn't an error, it was just a warning. Uh, and the real thing that gets me is that they ran this by the OpenSSL mailing list. And they're like, hey, here's this thing. And nobody like yelled stop. Uh, and unfortunately, it meant that every SSL key and SSH key generated on these systems were completely broken. Uh, this is that line today. I went back and, and kind of dug up what, what they had done with the line. So in OpenSSL, they have these giant comments on either side of it saying, please don't remove this. It's critical to the security of the system. But uh, as I said, every system seems to get, have been getting its day. Uh, this one was from Android. Uh, Android, the base operating system brand number generator, was broken for a number of years. Uh, this was found out because uh, folks were using Bitcoin applications on their Android phones, and their Bitcoin wallets were being stolen. Uh, and it was kind of traced back to this. Uh, Juniper, uh, this was around this time last year. It had been discovered that the constants in the random number generator and a lot of their appliances, they didn't know where those came from. Uh, and unfortunately, they were using a random number generator that is known to be back, backdoorable. Uh, in fact, it was the Dually C random number generator that even years before uh, Ed Snowden released the documents around this, uh, these cryptographers had kind of said and presented this at the 2007 crypto conference, hey, this, this standard is totally backdoorable. No one should use it, but they were. And then lastly, FreeBSD had their own uh, this uh, fortunately never made it into a released version, but it was broken uh, in the, the current branch for around four months because they were in the middle of refactoring the random number generator. Uh, last one, not using random data when it's required. Uh, this one bit Sony. So Sony was using an algorithm called the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm, uh, which like its non-elliptic curve uh, variant, has a parameter K, uh, and K has to be uniformly random for every signature. Uh, it turns out they were using a constant value. Uh, and through a little uh, algebra manipulation, you can actually use this to get the private key that signs the data from this. Uh, I believe they then went around and used that to uh, load homebrew software on it. So kind of fun, though. Uh, so really vital. Use a crypto strong random number generator when it's needed. Uh, if you're on Unix-like system, read from Devi random. There is some debate and consternation around this one, but I'm firmly in the read, just read from Devi random camp. Uh, on Windows, you have random number generator and .NET, encryption random uh, in your base standard library. Next, uh, talk about a little bit about hash functions. Uh, you'll often hear hash functions called a fingerprint, uh, and they really have a lot of similarities. Uh, both are one way. So when you when you look at a fingerprint on like a glass, like say I grabbed a glass and you kind of look at it later, without any kind of fingerprint database, you wouldn't be able to know anything about that. Like just the fingerprint itself doesn't give you any information. Uh, so it's not reversible without having some kind of fingerprint database. And ideally, no two people should have the same fingerprint. Uh, we think of this as for a hash function, no two inputs should yield the same output in an ideal world. Uh, the first one, using old weak algorithms. Uh, this will unfortunately be a little bit of a, a common one that we had touched on today. Uh, this was in 2008. Uh, these researchers used a whole bunch of PS3s to, um, in kind of a Cluster configuration to predict the uh, the the hat or the hash function output of MD5 when it came to a digital certificate, so something that they got from a CA, uh, such that they were able to match what the CA's output was going to be on the when they signed the certificate, they were able to match what the signature was going to come out to, 
but on their own inputs, uh, using previously, at that point, unknown problems with MD5, and it took a lot of computation, which is why they used the PS3s. But this was sort of like the death knell for MD5 in the CA industry. It had been on its way out, but people were obviously still using it. So they used this to get themselves uh, their own in, uh, intermediate CA certificate as a demo. Uh, the next one, uh, Flame, the malware that, uh, you know, is kind of well known now for being infecting, uh, computer systems in Iran. When they, when the researchers, uh, kind of like reversed this, they found previously unknown, uh, problems with MD5 in that malware that had been used to exploit this, showing that there was probably some kind of intelligence service at work, uh, with this, because they, they burned one of their MD5 exploits, or potentially one of their MD5 exploits, uh, by putting in this malware. And then uh, lastly, uh, in the last, uh, this was October 2015, there was a paper published called Free Start Collisions in Full SHA-1. This doesn't mean SHA-1 is 100% broken, but it means like the writings on the wall stop using SHA-1. Uh, this uh, definitely accelerated the CA industry's move off of SHA-1. They had been doing it for a while, but this kind of was used as justification for not slowing down and if maybe moving faster. Next one, this one's just a fun one. Uh, the United States Cyber Command, that's their logo. Um, on the inside gold ring, there's some, some letters and numbers. Uh, and this is it blown up. So it turns out this is a hash digest. And it's a hash digest of their mission statement using MD5. Uh, so this is like cryptography as a design aesthetic. I'm not really sure. I have no idea why they used MD5 for this because it was well known that you shouldn't at that point. And I think person just didn't care because it was going into a logo. But it's funny. Uh, the next one's misunderstanding, you know, what do we mean by a signature versus a checksum? Uh, so uh, it took a while for me to find something, but this is, uh, you know, we kind of, if you've been around a while, you're pretty used to seeing like a directory listing on like an FTP server or something. And invariably there's always this like MD5 sums or SHA1 sums file, which contains all the files in that directory and then their associated checksum. And, uh, you know, this, this is still pretty common today, uh, but sometimes what will happen here in the misconception is that when you download the file and you download that, that SHA sums file and you compare them, you think, ah, this software hasn't been modified, the checksums matched. And really you should be thinking, ah, the software just didn't get corrupted during download, which is really what they're going for. These aren't digitally signed with like GPG or anything, so if someone goes and modifies one of these Tarbot files, they might as well just update the SHA-1 sums file as well, uh, which has happened to um, you know, open source software in the past. Uh, the last one is length extension attack. Uh, I'm not gonna go super in depth into this one because it gets kind of complicated very quickly, but it is fascinating, so I recommend you go and look more into it later if you're interested. And the gist of what we're getting at uh, when we're looking at these length extension attacks is that the people invariably wanted a MAC or a message authentication code. And a MAC is an algorithm which takes some kind of shared key and some kind of value and then produces an output we call the tag. The tag is just this thing that you send along with the value and the other end can just validate that the value wasn't changed in transit. It's a symmetric authentication algorithm. The naive way uh, to think about this, uh, that people will construct these, is they'll just append a key and some value and run it through SHA-256. It's still pretty common, still see it today, uh, and this is vulnerable to a length extension attack, which the gist of it is, if I generate my signature using this, uh, I can then sign this new thing, knowing not knowing the secret, not knowing the original value, but knowing what I want to append in the, in the current signature. Uh, so this, this is called a length extension attack. It's based on the uh, kind of some features or some fundamentals of how these hash algorithms work. So I recommend going and investigating more if you're interested. Uh, what they should have done in this case is use, as I said, uh, Mac. So there's an HMAC, which is built up using hash functions uh, that operates like this. So this, this one isn't just a theoretical vulnerability. Uh, Flickr had this. So uh, these folks reported it and they had to iterate their API because they had this vulnerability. And then Visa uh, actually released a new payments API that had this vulnerability in it. Uh, to their credit, they very quickly uh, fixed this, but it sh even goes kind of to show that today, an organization with the InfoSec resources such as Visa, people are still making uh, this, this simple mistake that we know about. 
so yeah, uh, if you need a fingerprint, use SHA-256. Uh, I do know that SHA-3 is around. There's a lot of debates around using it. Um, I'm not ready to jump on that bandwagon. I still recommend SHA-256 to people. Uh, if you need uh, a signature, a Mac, uh, HMAC is a really good choice with SHA-256. Uh, stop using MD5, meaning like if you have a system that uses MD5, you should really be making a plan to get off of that. Uh, and don't use SHA-1 in new projects. Uh, should probably be thinking about phasing, uh, moving away from it. Definitely if the system you're using it in requires collision resistance, as that's the first thing to go. Next up is password storage, but I'm skipping that because this is a conference of security people and uh, there wasn't really anything new. I hope everybody here is sort of, you know, in the camp of use bcrypt or scrypt or whatever. Uh, you can read more. Uh, the only thing that was in here that was uh, different than just password storage was uh, something that I've already blogged about and then it's already been, repo it's been reposted to the B-Sides Philly blog. So it is a blog I wrote called Don't Wait to Fix Your Password Storage. Uh, and talks about method, a method that I recommend to people who find themselves with less than ideal password storage uh, techniques. So you can go check those links out. Uh, and that was to save time, uh, so we can talk about quantum computers later. Uh, ciphers, uh, once again, old weak algorithms kind of rears its ugly head. Uh, breaking ciphers with Copacabana, this was uh, presented at a crypto conference in 2006, and even then, they uh, they kind of looked at they could build a specialized piece of hardware for less than ten thousand that uh, ten thousand dollars that could break you know digital DES the digital uh, sorry the uh, the DES algorithm in basically no appreciable amount of time. So people really shouldn't be using DES even at this point in two thousand six. It had been replaced by AES uh, and triple DES. But yeah, I still kind of occasionally run into a system where they're still using DES, and it's because they have like a terabyte worth of data that was encrypted with DES, and they don't know what to do about it. Uh, it's totally broken. You can't rely on it for any security. This probably costs like a dollar on Amazon to break now. So uh, really have to get off that. The next one, uh, weaknesses in the scheduling algorithm of RC4. This was presented in 2001. Uh, it was kind of like saying, hey, we see that RC4 is not this really ideal thing, uh, and yet even like up until like two years ago, people were still using RC4 uh, in their TLS configurations because it was the only recommended way to combat the beast attack that everybody was so scared of. Uh, it actually took a different paper uh, in 2015 where they really just kind of hammered in that RC4 was broken and things like TLS uh, to get people to finally move off it and to get vulnerability scanners like Qualys to start flagging it as a vulnerability. Uh, next up, using ECB for uh, block ciphers. Uh, quick refresher on block ciphers. AES is a block cipher, and what block ciphers are is uh, a pair of functions. There's an encrypt function and a decrypt function. Both of them take a key. In AES cases, the key is 128, 192, or 256 bits long. Uh, and then they both take a 128-bit value, and the encrypt, it's the plain text, and the decrypt, it's the ciphertext, and then you kind of swap them. Uh, the problem here is most people don't have 128 bits of data that they want to encrypt. Their data is typically a lot longer than that. Uh, so the, you know, when you're kind of thinking through this, well, what am I going to do? Uh, a natural thing that people sometimes will jump to is, I know, I'll just take it 120 bits at a time or 16 bytes at a time and loop over it and just encrypt each thing. They would not be alone in this. This is actually a formalized method. Uh, it's called ECB or electronic codebook mode. Uh, and this is unfortunately very common and unfortunately very broken. Uh, and one of the reasons it's broken, among others, is that if there's any pattern in the underlying uh, data, that pattern's going to shine straight through like a beacon. Uh, so for example, this is my company's logo and then my company's logo encrypted with ECB mode. The patterns shine straight through. Uh, this is certainly not the only problem with it, but this is the one that sort of like people remember because it's visual and kind of, oh yeah, that's a problem. You'll sometimes see this with uh, Tux, the Linux penguin. Uh, it's pr also pretty common, but I wanted to make my own. Ideally, when we encrypt something, we want something that's at the bottom where it's just garbage. You don't know what they're, what they're trying to tell you. Uh, the last one is not using authenticated encryption. So what we mean by this is that uh, 
back in the beginning when we talked about confidentiality and we talked about authentication, we now know after lots of research and study that you actually can't have confidentiality unless you also have integrity. Uh, and un unfortunately for many years, the algorithms we used uh, for encryption didn't provide, uh, only provided confidentiality and not also integrity. Uh, if you're using an algorithm that provides both, that's called authenticated encryption. And here are some problems if you're not using authenticated encryption. Uh, there, uh, this is a very, very famous paper presented in 2002. Uh, this has been the underlying paper that uh, has basically spawned the issues in TLS, a bunch of issues in TLS, uh, where Serge Vadne uh, talked about hey, how TLS used its CBC mode ciphers uh, incorrectly and how that was going to cause problems. And people basically took this paper and have just basically been finding different places where they can attack it in TLS for a couple years. So this was Beast, Poodle, uh, and then I think Lucky 13 and one other. Uh, so the, uh, the, this has not been fixed until uh, very, very recently. TLS 1.3 will finally fix the, the kind of core problem of this, uh, even though it's been known for so long. So as I mentioned, practical padding oracle attacks, this was the beast attack uh, from 2010. And this was just straight up implementing Serge Vodney's attack. Uh, Apple, uh, they had a flaw in iMessages that allowed you to do some interesting things with iMessage attachments. Uh, once again, because they weren't using authenticated encryption throughout the system. Uh, this one, I only include the paper because I thought it was a very interesting title. This is the Apple paper. paper excuse me, uh, dance on the lip of the volcano, chosen ciphertext attack on Apple iMessage. Uh, the professor behind this, Matthew Green, said that he jokes that like he's probably not going to let grad students name their papers anymore. Uh, but it was, a, it was a fun name. And I, you know, I, I think that security professionals really should take a lot of the blame uh, for this, or should take more of the blame than we're willing to. Uh, we basically have created this world of hurt for developers by essentially giving people so many options. As, you know, developers, especially for both developers and security people, we love to give people options. Uh, and so behind this, uh, this is the PyCrypto documentation for AES. Uh, and the first thing it has you do is you need to choose what cipher mode you want to use. You shouldn't ever give anyone that choice. You should pick a good cipher mode and use that. Uh, so there's a bunch of uh, cipher modes, none of which are authenticated cipher modes. Uh, and then the example uses output feedback mode, which no system uses that I've ever um, heard of. It's just sort of like one of those things where like in the 90s people were like, oh yeah, this is another way we can do it. And I got a Wikipedia page. And so occasionally you'll see it implemented in crypto libraries. Uh, so definitely prefer the box, secret box uh, style uh, algorithms from uh, LibSodium. This is like, it's pre-done authenticated encryption. It's well understood. It's uh, you know, it's very good. Uh, there are a lot of different way, uh, systems that now implement this. Stop using DES. Stop building your own on top of AES, which is so, so popular. Uh, and then stop uh, encrypting without protecting the integrity also. So stop using unauthenticated encryption. So I know someone in the audience is probably thinking, I work in a regulated industry. I have to use AES. So do I. Uh, so if you do have to use AES uh, for a variety of different reasons, uh, don't use it in ECB mode. Uh, be sure to use authenticated uh, encryption. So GCM is sort of like the go-to right now, uh, authenticated encryption mode for AES. Uh, and then verify the tag Mac first. And then you still have tons of problems that you may mess up in a critical way. So this, depending on the system, maybe a good opportunity to hire a professional. Next up, uh, talk a little bit about uh, TLS, everybody's favorite whipping boy. Um, so the first problem here, not verifying the certificate chain or host name. Uh, there's a paper from 2012, the most dangerous code in the world, validating SSL certificates and non-browser software. In this paper, they, uh, they surveyed a bunch of uh, like iPhone and Android apps, as well as like client libraries for server-side stuff, things that were, had to do SSL but weren't browsers. And they found out it was pretty bad. Uh, so this is a really interesting read, very humbling. Uh, this, you know, is something that you'll occasionally still run into a developer who will turn off SSL verification in development mode and that code just gets checked in and goes straight up to production without ever changing. I just include this in here as a little joke break. Um, 
thought this was, was kind of funny. There's, you know, this sort of kind of leans into the Internet of Things wave that everybody seems to be going into right now. We have an Internet of Things that probably aren't validating SSL and include outdated versions of OpenSSL in them and things like that. Uh, next, talk uh, briefly about uh, not validating the certificate chain. So uh, I, I stole this from a blog. I really should have, I forgot to put the blog uh, post in there. But uh, the way that you can kind of think about certificate chain checking is uh, you trust Captain Picard because he's Captain Picard. You, everybody trusts Captain Picard. And he's sort of like the certificate authority. But you don't trust Ensign Tony. Why would you? He's a red shirt. And that's sort of like the, the uh, server certificate. But Captain Picard uh, trusts Jory LaForge, and Jory LaForge trusts Ensign Tony. Therefore, you have this chain of trust. Uh, and you can kind of you know validate that all the way down. Uh, and so that's great. You validated that you trust the certificates, uh, but that doesn't that doesn't mean that you've uh, validated who that certificate is. So that leads us into hostname verification. Um, I kind of think of this as uh, I went to a store one time and the I handed the checkout person my credit card, and they're like, "I'm also going to need to see some ID." So I handed them an ID, but I didn't realize I had my wife's ID in my wallet also. Uh, and they just looked at it, didn't even validate the names on the two things, and just handed me my ID back. Uh, that's not, that's very similar to not validating the host name. Uh, so in this case, you're handed a valid SSL certificate, and it chains correctly, and the signature is good, uh, but you don't check who it's named for. So they could have just gotten a certificate from like Let's Encrypt or whoever for free. Uh, this was one of the other vulnerabilities that they analyzed in the paper. This was pretty common. Uh, so anybody would just go get a free certificate and it would, you could man in the middle of their connections. Uh, so for hostname verification, uh, check that you got the certificate you intended to connect to. Uh, the problem here and why it's sort of done a little bit less often than you would hope is that hostname verification is protocol dependent, meaning it's different for HTTP than for like SMTP versus like FTPS. Uh, and OpenSSL thus doesn't have it built in because it's protocol dependent and OpenSSL is protocol agnostic. Uh, so you, you then have to lean on something like a cur libcurl or something that implements the various protocols. Uh, this is a problem where if your uh, SSL library just implements its own HTTP parsing on top of uh, OpenSSL, which Rust had this in very recently, uh, you just totally skip the hosting verification part because you think OpenSSL is doing it. Uh, next, misconfigured server settings. Uh, I blinked out the name to protect the, the innocent here, or not so innocent, I guess. Uh, but this was a government website in Europe. Uh, and what happened, uh, so uh, Qualys runs SSL Labs, which is an amazing site to check out. Uh, and they, this, this server got an F. Uh, you should go check out your own sites, because it's very eye-opening uh, to check out not just your main site. That one's probably pretty good. But what about all your, like, you know, the Nagios and the Munin and all the other like side instances that have been set up over the years. Uh, so SSL Labs, excellent resource. Uh, highly recommend that. Uh, if you don't want people to know how bad you are, you can check the little box saying don't put this in the public results. For things behind a firewall, uh, so you have to get onto like the jump box into the production infrastructure for like internal services, there's testssl.sh, which is a bash script which scripts OpenSSL to t test a bunch of stuff. It's very, very similar to SSL Labs, but you can run it uh, yourself behind a firewall. Highly recommend that one as well. Um, and if you don't know what SSL settings should be, or TLS settings you should be using in your server, Mozilla has you covered. Uh, they uh, put out the SSL config generator. You just drop in, you're like, I'm using Nginx with this OpenSSL, and then they give you a bunch of recommended settings. Uh, last one, using a broken library. Uh, we're all familiar with Heartbleed, I hope. Uh, so Heartbleed, broken library. The, uh, you know, I don't want to get on a soapbox about dependency management, but I'm sure in the next year or two we will still hear about a system busted because it was, or uh, someone popped because they're using a Heartbleed vulnerable system. Uh, same with, uh, there was Apple's go-to fail bug where they weren't validating the, the SSL handshake correctly, and that caused... Uh, that was in OS X and iOS for a while. The, the problem here is we lean a lot on these libraries, and for good reason. Uh, you know, we want to trust that the library is doing it correctly. Unfortunately, we've had a huge rash of these libraries not doing the right thing sometimes. So lean on them, but also just give them a good double check. Uh, 
there, there was one that actually like broke, well, I think it was AF networking for iOS, broke their SSL verification in like an intermediate version. So it was good, then they broke it for a while, then it was good again. Uh, so set up automated tests uh, if this really matters to you. Uh, and you can use badssl.com as an example of like all the various ways SSL can, uh, can be bad. Next, talk uh, just briefly about trust. Uh, so raise your hand if you've ever seen this line before. All right. Now keep your hand up if you validated the fingerprint before you typed yes. That's what I thought. Me too. Uh, so uh, what this is is that uh, SSH uses a system of trust called Tofu or Trust on First Use, and it's sort of SSH saying, I got a lot of fancy math that can check all this, these signatures, but I need you to do it first because I don't ship with any trust chains. Uh, and you're kind of saying, okay, SSH, I got your back. This one's good. Remember that for later. And if that trust chain ever breaks, then uh, SSH is like, hey, you wanted me to tell you when that trust chain was broken? Here it is. Uh, and the solution here, unfortunately, if you like Google this and go to Stack Overflow, is usually like RMRF the known host file. Uh, instead, you should really like surgically just remove that one line because typically this is like I reinstalled the system or some system came up with sharing the IP address of uh, of a previous one. Um, next, this is for dramatic effect. Me scrolling through the list of all the CAs that were shipping by default in Firefox as of like six months ago. Uh, and this kind of is sort of a like, hey, do you, do you know all these companies? Do you trust them? Do you uh, kind of like know that they're doing good hiring, good firing, you know, good cleanup, all these things? They all are audited extensively uh, through the, the web audit standard. Uh, but even that, um, there was uh, two CAs, or really one CA, I think it was Wosign in China that, uh, it was sort of found that they were like doing all kinds of nasty stuff they should not have been doing, like backdating SSL certificates to get around rules and uh, just like doing all kinds of really bad stuff. Uh, and then they weren't reporting things like we acquired another CA and had been doing the same thing for them too. Uh, that was Startcom. So if you're using Willsign or Startcom, switch to a different one because they're about to be delisted by Google and Mozilla and a bunch of others, or they're about to be implicitly not trusted, or explicitly not trusted, rather. Uh, and they're in here, um, so yay. You do have a little bit of freedom and an option. Uh, one thing is called certificate pinning. So certificate pinning is where you kind of explicitly lay out how you want your trust chains to, to work. Uh, this works, uh, at least in, in browsers, there's something called the public key pinning standard, uh, which is starting to gain some traction, works kind of like, uh, strict transport security and that the first time you go to the page, the, it's a header that gets sent down and then the browser kind of makes note of it and then goes back later and enforces it. Uh, so this is something interesting. If you really do need the kind of the guarantees, look, check out public key pinning. One thing to note is that it will not stop uh, if a company has, ins or, or an attacker has installed a root CA on the system and uses that to like generate a certificate from their installed root CA, this will just blow right by and totally uh, ignore your pins for that. Uh, because that's how like all these all these corporate environments have man in the middle of their, their uh, employee traffic. So if they broke that, they would break a huge chunk of their customers. That often, people are like, why? And then when you think about it, you're like, oh, I understand why now. Um, so think about what organizations you really trust. Uh, investigate certificate pinning in your apps if it's important to you. And then lastly, I want to talk just ever so briefly about quantum computers. Uh, so we, every five years, we're like, ah, it's 10, 20 years away. Uh, and I think those 10, 20 years is starting to really, uh, really kind of, you know, writing's on the wall once again that it's going to happen sooner rather than later. Uh, there are a bunch of companies. D-Wave is sort of marketing, sort of uh, actually getting to something. But uh, we, what we do know is that uh, people are banking on quantum computers coming. Uh, there are intelligence agencies doing mass traffic, uh, you know, scooping up massive amounts of traffic and then storing them away in large hard drives and mountains so that in 20 years when they do have a quantum computer, they can go back and decrypt them. That is a reality. We're pretty certain that's happening. So the pitfall here is assuming current crypto will last forever. 
And the reason we can't really assume that is because of this paper published in 1997 by Peter Shore. Uh, this is what gives practical cryptographers nightmares. Uh, and the paper was polynomial time algorithms for prime, prime factorization in discrete logarithms on a quantum computer. Uh, and if you've studied cryptography for a little bit but haven't seen this, you might think to yourself, prime factorization, that's RSA. Discrete logarithms, that's basically everything else. Uh, you know, you know, uh, ECDH, Diffie, finite field Diffie-Hellman. All the public uh, key encryption systems we use uh, are theoretically breakable in polynomial time on a quantum computer of a sufficient size. It's pretty scary. Uh, so we, we know that this is an eventuality, uh, most likely. And Google very recently did an experiment, although they, they did end it after a year. So uh, they turned it, or they ended after a couple months, they turned on in Chrome, uh, when you talk to Google servers, some percentage of users will, in addition to getting uh, an elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman key exchange, also got a quantum computer, uh, a quantum resistant algorithm key exchange on top of that. Uh, so they, they picked one of the quantum algorithms that was showing promise at the time, and they implemented that, and although it ballooned the packet size, so like your key exchange, you know, gets quite a bit larger, uh, they said that they had 100% uh, coverage, like they didn't see any uh, downplay in traffic, like people's traffic didn't die in the middle because of some weird proxy, uh, which is good. That's kind of what they're going for here. But it's really important they, they did not want this to become like a de facto standard. Uh, but what this did is it layered the quantum post uh, quantum algorithm on top of it in such a way that you at least had the elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman strength. And then uh, if you... Uh, if this algorithm is actually quantum resistant, then you also got that strength. So this traffic uh, theoretically would not be decryptable even under a quantum computer. So uh, follow the post-quantum crypto discussion, but stay away from it for a while because the industry is nowhere near the, the standards. But there is an active uh, group working on this, trying to figure out what the best, best things to use. Uh, and then the last thing is hope researchers are moving fast enough. All right, uh, it is finally over. Uh, if you're interested in this, Stanford runs a free crypto class uh, on Coursera, which is excellent. Uh, the part two to this class is, I like to describe like the Bigfoot of Coursera classes. They like every couple months they'll announce it. It's gonna be in six months and then that time rolls around and like I've gotten, the course has started and then stopped emails. Like uh, I've gotten course surveys. Like the, the class seems to never be, never going to happen, but uh, the part one class is, is really good. Masano Crypto Challenges uh, from uh, now on Crypto Pals. This is sort of coming from a developer standpoint of uh, writing code that will break these algorithms and these kind of uh, things through a bunch of different increasingly harder problems. If you're looking for code challenges, I think this one's really excellent. And that is all I, all I have questions. Uh, and remember, I tweeted a link to the slides, so if you're interested in the slides, you can find it on Twitter. And you can follow me while, you, while, you, while you're on my profile page. Uh, I will take questions if there are any. All right, thank you.